Hey there, teachers and students. My name is Benjamin, and I teach teachers the skills they need to pass certification exams. This is my series covering the Texas Math 7 through 12 exam for certification in Texas. This video is going to be part four in my section covering competency two, which requires the teacher to understand the complex number system, its structures, operations, algorithms, and representations. So this video is going to be titled Graphing Complex Numbers. So the graphing of complex numbers is traditionally done on a two-dimensional coordinate plane, just like the XY plane that you're probably used to from normal geometry. So the only difference, at least for starters, is that instead of labeling the horizontal axis as X and the vertical axis as Y, we're going to go ahead and be labeling the horizontal axis as the real axis and the vertical axis as the imaginary one. But Graphing complex numbers, you'll find, is a very simple because it's just like graphing normal two-dimensional coordinates from geometry. So if we zoom in here on this, um, if we zoom in here on this coordinate plane, what you're going to see is I have a couple of coordinates listed here. Let's go ahead and graph them out for practice. You, you see the point 2, negative 3. I'm, you know, I'm just going to count over 2 in the positive x direction. And I'm going to count down 3 in the negative y direction. You're going to see the point right here and I can label it 2 comma negative 3. Now, let's try to graph the point negative 5, 4. I'm going to count negative 5 in the x direction, and then I'm going to go ahead and count positive 4 in the y direction. Now I have my point right here, negative 5 comma 4. It's super easy to graph rectangular coordinates on a normal x, y grid, and it's just as easy to graph rectangular form for a complex number on a normal two-dimensional imaginary real grid. So this is a complex number with its real portion 2 and its imaginary portion negative 3i. What we're going to do is we're going to take the magnitude of the real portion, which is positive 2, and then we're going to take the magnitude of the imaginary portion, which is going to be negative 3, and we're going to plot it just like as if those were the coordinates. So it's literally going to be the exact same points that we just did over on the left. So 2 minus 3i. That's going to take us down. I'm going to go over 2, down 3. And this is going to be the complex number, or this point at least, is going to represent the complex number 2 minus 3i. Same thing with the negative 5 plus 4i. I'm going to go 5 degrees in the negative real direction. Positive, uh, four, 4 points in the positive imaginary direction. And this point right here is going to represent the imaginary, or the complex number, negative 5 plus 4i. All right, so because this form of complex numbers is considered rectangular, other aspects of rectangular geometry work the same as well. So for example, if I wanted to find the magnitude of the position of this complex number 5 minus 6i, well, first off, all I need to do is plot it. All right, so I have it plotted down here. All right, 5, positive 5 in the real direction, negative 6 in the imaginary direction, and I have a vector coming out from the origin of my grid touching the point that represents the complex number 5 minus 6i. And if we're looking for the magnitude of this point, all we need to do is find the distance of that line. All that requires is the normal rectangular distance formula, which you see here in red. All right, let's go ahead and solve this together. I'm writing in orange, of course. The a, of course, remember the form is a minus bi, so that a that I have in the formula is going to be 5, and that b that I have in the formula is going to be negative 6. So if I go ahead and write this out, I have the square root of 5 squared plus negative 6 squared. All right? So the square root of 5 squared plus negative 6 squared, if I simplify that one step, I'm going to have 25 plus 36 underneath my radical. Now, if I go ahead and add those together, I'm going to get something like, what, the square root of 61? I don't think that there's any perfect square that I can factor out of 61, so we're just going to leave that irrational number, square root of 61, but it is the actual length of this vector line, so I'm going to go ahead and label here square root of 61. Now, there's a reason that we took a slide to go ahead and remind you that you can find the magnitude of a point in the rectangular form, just like in normal rectangular coordinates, because we can actually use that magnitude, that distance from the origin, as the radius in our polar form. So you are going to have to write 
complex numbers, not just in A plus B I or rectangular form, you are going to have to write them in polar form as well. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. And we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like, what the form of a complex number looks like in polar form, because it's really closely tied to the rectangular form. In fact, it's pretty easy to convert it to the polar form from the, rect from the rectangular form, as long as you can just go ahead and find the magnitude of the point in rectangular form, and you can do a little bit of right triangle trigonometry, okay? Not too hard. You'll remember Sokotoa from school, hopefully. Let's talk about what I have on this side. So complex numbers can also be written in polar form. Suppose we plot some arbitrary point, okay? It doesn't matter what they are, all right? I'm going to pretend like it's in the positive um, for the real and the imaginary, so it's in quadrant one, all right? And I'm going to label this point Z, all right? So this Z has a magnitude of R, all right? The variable letter R comes from the fact that it's the radius, so this is kind of going into polar form here. But you find it the same way if you already have the rectangular coordinates or the rectangular form. So R is going to be the hypotenuse of a right triangle that we're going to draw with respect to the actual axes of our grid, all right? And assuming that we find that magnitude R, then there's only one other thing that we need in order to write this whole thing in polar form. All right. What we need is that angle theta, the one that you see right here. Okay. And it's really nice because, or at least it's really nice having this right triangle because then all you need to do in order to get this data is you need to remember a little bit of right triangle trigonometry in um, Sokotoa. So what this is telling us here is um, you'll see SOH. It's saying that sine of theta is equal to the opposite leg from the theta divided by the hypotenuse of your right triangle. All right. So if I was talking about sine of theta here, Okay, that's going to be equal to the opposite leg, which is B, divided by the hypotenuse, which in this case is our magnitude R, our radius R. All right, and whatever numbers are for B over R, if I, sine of theta is going to be equal to B over R. And the reason why that's so useful is because there's this trigonometric rule that says that, well, if sine of theta is equal to B over R, then sine of inverse B over R is going to be equal to theta. And that's exactly how we're going to find theta. But usually we're going to go ahead and use tangent because a lot of times the, you know, your R is going to be something kind of irrational or something weird. Some, a lot of times with a radical because you have to actually take the square root of something. So tangent actually uh, allows you to bypass using the hypotenuse because it's just tangent theta. Tangent theta is equal to the opposite leg divided by the adjacent leg. So like you'd see in this case, that's just going to be tangent theta is equal to B over A. All right, so tangent theta, if tangent theta is equal to B over A, then inverse tangent of B over A is going to be equal to theta. All right, and that's all well and good, and that's actually how we derive our polar form, because, you know, if um, sine of theta is equal to B over R, then we can say, just by doing a little bit of algebra, multiplying both sides by R, that B is actually just equal to R sine theta. All right. And by that logic, um, where cosine is just um, where cosine is just adjacent over hypotenuse, then we could say that a is equal to r cosine theta. All right. And if we literally just plug in uh, r sine theta for b and r cosine theta for a, then what you get from the original form, right? Because the original form is z is equal to a plus b i. But if you plug in r cosine theta for a, then you have r cosine theta for you as your first term, and then plus bi, r sine theta is b, and then times i. So that's literally our polar form. The only thing different is that because they both have the term r in them, you, we go ahead and uh, factor that out to get our final uh, polar form here. z is equal to r times the quantity cosine theta plus i sine theta. So in this case, instead of a and b being our uh, coordinates, well, a and b are our coordinates in rectangular form, but now our coordinates are just r and theta. And we found r using our rectangular coordinates. Um, we just need to find theta using a little tiny bit of right triangle trig. Um, and really, it's just you just need a calculator to like do tan inverse of a over b. It's, or I'm sorry, tan inverse of b over a. You see it right there. Tan inverse of b over a is equal to theta in this case. So hopefully that's not too tricky, um, we can actually see examples of that. So let's go ahead and move on. Uh, one more thing I wanted to touch base on before we go is um, you, can, you can pretty well assume that if theta is greater than 90 degrees, then it's no longer in 
the first quadrant. It's it's now going to go into the second quadrant, um, and when it's between 90 and 180 degrees, and it's in that second quadrant, okay, sine theta is always going to be positive still because the imaginary version is still above zero. But once you go into that second quadrant, the the real portion is going to go into negative, and and part of the real portion is now denoted by cosine theta. So our cosine theta is always going to be negative, and and you know, when you go into the third quadrant past 180 degrees, but before 270 degrees, of course, your real and imaginary portions are going to be negative. So, of course, sine theta and cosine theta are going to be negative. And then for when theta is in the fourth quadrant between 270 and 360 degrees, then you're going to get your cosine theta to be positive again, but your sine theta is always going to be negative. I mean, this is not super something. Um, oops, erase that. This is not something that you need to worry too much about. You'll probably see that naturally happening with the mathematics that you're doing. But, uh, you know, just something to keep in mind, maybe. So let's see our first actual example here. All right. So I went ahead and um, wrote out a grid here. Um, I'm going to be labeling the imaginary axis as YI now um, and positive and the horizontal axis is just X. The real axis is X. That's what you see in a lot of textbooks. But the question is, what is the polar form of the complex number Z is equal to negative two plus four I? All right. So. The first thing I'm going to want to do here is if I'm trying to get into polar form, then I need to find the magnitude. So I'm going to go ahead and just plot this point using the rectangular coordinates negative 2, 4. So the rectangular coordinates negative 2, 4 are going to take me here. You'll see because I went negative 2 in the real direction and then down 4 in the imaginary direction. Pretty simple. All right. So if I have this point and this point denoted by the complex number or representing the complex number negative 2 plus 4, I, oh, wow, I just made a mistake there. You guys are probably screaming at me through the screen. It's actually positive 4, so it's not in the third quadrant. It is going to be in the second quadrant. So negative 2 and then up 4 to right here. All right, so now we have the right point. All right, so and that's going to represent the complex number negative 2 plus 4i. Now, if we have this point here, we can go ahead and find the magnitude here or the radius in polar form pretty quickly using the using the distance formula. So r or r, which is going to be this hypotenuse, r is going to be equal to the square root of. I always do this thing where I try to where I start writing diagonally on a screen. Let's be careful not to do that. So our a negative two squared negative two squared plus, and then our B is going to be positive four, so four squared, all right? If I go ahead and simplify that one step, what that's gonna give me is four plus 16. Simplify that one more step, we're gonna have the square root of 20. And I like the square root of 20 because I can actually pull out a perfect square from 20. I can factor out a perfect square from 20 and that perfect square is four. So that's gonna be equal to Two, I mean, the square root of 4 times 5, and the whole point of doing this, and you may not be super comfortable with this practice yet, but it is ne it's necessary to simplify a radical to its most simple form, um, because the square root of 4 is 2, so I can rewrite this as 2 times the square root of 5. All right, and then 5 is not a perfect square. There's no, there's no perfect square I can factor out of it, so that's it. Um, we have 2 times the square root of 5. That's as simple as I can write that magnitude. So at least we know what our r is, so that's going to be equal to r. Now that we have our r, we're going to need to go ahead and find our theta. So we're actually looking for our angle theta here. All right. So our angle theta here is going to be made up of, well, we can find it using sine, cosine, and tangent. But I definitely don't want to use sine and tangent, especially because I have an irrational number as my magnitude for r. So I definitely, I mean, I don't want to use sine and cosine because I have a, a, an irrational number as my magnitude for r. So what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to use inverse tangent. And of course, with SOHCAHTOA, tangent theta is going to be equal to opposite, which in this case is our B, and then B over A, because A is going to be our adjacent. Okay. So um, that's B over A. What was our B again? Our B was 4, and our A was negative 2. All right. So that's just equal to negative 2, if I simplify that. So tan theta equals negative 2. And then now that I have that, what I need is tan inverse of negative 2. All right. 
and what you should get from tan inverse of negative 2. I have it right here. You're going to probably need to use a calculator to actually do this. But tan inverse of negative 2 should give you something like, um, what is this? It should be 180 minus 117. Something like 63 degrees. Something like 63 degrees. So this angle right here is 63 degrees. All right. So that's great. But what we, when we actually give our theta in our polar form, what we're measuring is how big of an angle it is from the positive real axis. So all you have to do is just take that from 180 and you get 117. All right. 117 degrees. Hopefully that wasn't too confusing there. Yeah, we want this big angle, the angle measured from the positive real axis. All right, so finding a, a theta of 63 degrees here helps us do that because if we subtract it from 180, we'll get what's left here. Now, if that's confusing, please uh, mention in the comments. We comments we can um, we can do a couple more examples where we we talk a little bit more about finding that theta. But now that we know that theta, the theta that we're looking for is going to be equal to 117 degrees. We can go ahead and write out our full polar form, even if we have to go back and review it a little bit. Remember that was r times cosine theta plus i sine theta, where cosine theta plus i sine theta are in parentheses. And then, so that means that in polar form, the complex number negative 2 plus 4i is going to be written as 2 square root 5 times the quantity cosine of 117 degrees plus i times the sine of 117 degrees and for the rest of the course, probably, we're probably going to try to stay in degrees, not too much work in radians. But that is all for this topic. If you have any questions or need some more practice, which you might, I have a lot of examples in this topic. So if you need any further practice, don't hesitate to get in touch. I can do another video on it, or I can just send you some more examples with the notes. Obviously, I'll make these notes available for you. But, uh, you know, you can go ahead and email me via my email address if you have any other questions. Hit the like button for me if you don't mind. But more importantly, much more importantly, share this resource with other teachers who might need it. I'll see you in the next one.